Hello, Welsh Forest Focus, and miserable afternoon for Nottingham Forest as they lost 1 0 at Brighton today. Yes, we will talk VAR and we will talk a terrible goal conceded because this is Forest, but most definitely we will also talk about team selection, tactics, and substitutions in the company of, first of all, Emily Anderson. Emily, good evening. How are you? Not great. Yeah, not going to lie. Not feeling too, too good, I'm afraid. No, no, none of us are. We're normally, I've had all three of us something pretty positive, but it's not going to be like that this mm -hmm. evening, I'm sure. And joining us to make his podcast debut with the, well, the most thankless substitution task in football, coming on for Mark Southerns, <laughs> uh, which means you're coming on to talk about a defeat, probably, is Greg Oram. Greg, you've been a regular supporter, so it's good to have you with us. How are you doing? Yeah, well, firstly, thanks for having me on. It is really lovely to join you both. I wish it was under a different result, of course, and I'm feeling as deflated as both of you. I know we're going to get into it and pick it all apart and the comments will be flying in and social media has been melting down already. So I'm feeling a bit better than I did a couple of hours ago. I can say that much though. Uh, we'll kick us off, Emily, just general thoughts and then we'll, um, we'll break it down in detail, as Greg says. Yeah, I mean, first of all, really questionable team selection. Before the game, I, I was struggling to understand why some of our most attacking players were left on the bench. <laughs> and Elanga, Taiwo Awanyi, Callum Hudson-Odoi. But as I said in our podcast chat, I trust Nuno. He clearly knows what he's doing. Maybe he's thinking that once the Brighton players tire after their um, heavy defeat in Roma, then we bring on the big guns and we end up winning the game 1-0. And, and that's kind of how I went into the game when I saw the team selection. But barring, I think, the first five minutes, the first half, we might as well not have even been on the pitch. Brighton were average in the first half. We gifted them a goal, uh, gave away stupid fouls. It didn't get too much better in the second half when I assumed that after a half-time team talk, that I hope was a, a severe telling off. I wanted you to use a swear word then, but I resisted. I assumed that maybe those big guns would be coming on to start the second half. No, when they did, the formation didn't work. Nothing really changed. Taiwo Wanyi was struggling to get into the game. Sangare was non-existent. Um, Alanga tried, but couldn't get anywhere. We missed so many, well, we didn't have so many chances. Every chance we had, we missed. And they seemed to fall to Origi. And I feel like a player on form would have buried some of those goals. And I, for the first time this season, I'm struggling to find any positives from that game. And I just feel like we are for the taking against Luton and it's a real worry. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many worries that come out of that game. And, you know, I, I don't find any positives. We'll, we'll talk about the second half in detail, but I thought that was pretty rubbish as well, really. Um, let's start with team selection then, Greg. I said to people in the WhatsApp groups and, and chats, if we lose this game, Nuno is going to be in the spotlight. And I think he certainly is in the spotlight. What did you make of it? And to what degree do you think it cost us if you do think it was wrong? Well, when I first saw the team, I was surprised. I think everybody was probably surprised because we were expecting the front four that we have been um, so successful with on counters. hudson Adore, Langham, Gibbs-White and a one year. So to see Wood start was very positive. Um, Nilo was saying in the press conference just the other day, just before the game, that we was asked about Tyro, that Tyro has probably played too much football. And I think he probably did come back a bit earlier than planned and got through an adrenaline. But he, he certainly dropped off and that has shown. So to see Chris Wood back in the side was a, was a fantastic positive. Mm. But then to kind of switch to having Nico Dominguez coming in on that left side where he has played well, Sticking with Origi on the right, I, I I bought into it. I said, okay, fine. I could see what he was trying to do, and I bought into that team selection and was positive about it and thought, okay, we have got an absolutely fantastic-looking bench. We can get into Brighton, who are going to hopefully have a hangover following the 4-0 defeat in the week coming from Rome. So I was feeling quite positive. So maybe it was the right team, but it was just a bad performance. And had, had it come off, had we come away with a nil-nil, then maybe we wouldn't be feeling quite so um, disappointed. But it was those silly challenges again that crept back in. Against Liverpool, they seem to have cut them out quite a bit. But silly challenges again going on in our half that were costing us. I mean, I'm Obama Daly. If, I, if I'm honest with you, I I'm luck, think he was lucky not to get a second yellow for, for mm. that challenge that they scored from. And of course... It looks like a bit of karma. They score from it and it's a 
poor bit of goalkeeping possibly i think he could have done better with that i'm not going to let sales get off on that one and it goes in off the back of Omar Bamadeli's head so it was just a bizarre goal to concede but we had been asking for it we're giving away free kicks gross is whipping them in he's stacked up a load of assists this season so it was almost like we were making the same mistakes today as what we were making when we played against West Ham at the London Stadium, allowing James Ward-Prowse free reign with dead balls. And Pascal Gross is very, very dangerous. So I was really disappointed with how we set up in that first half. The shape was, wasn't was there. The, the, the Inga's yellow card possibly had an effect on how he played thereafter. It wasn't his best game. And like you said, I was expecting changes from, from the half-time. Well, I don't know why he waited. I think there was some questionable decisions from the very start. It's easy to look back and say, oh, the team was all wrong. I can't say that I was saying that before the game. I was trying to buy into what he was trying to do mm. and hopeful that that bench was going to be the difference. And it wasn't. And that's why I came away feeling so disappointed. We had a couple of chances. But, yeah, Rigi, he's the man that you want... Um, Perhaps you don't want rather on the end of that. You want a Langer, perhaps, or Hudson Adoy, who can definitely finish. So, yeah, feeling really disappointed and it might come back to bite us. I think the thing I didn't understand, Emily, I didn't mind. I could sort of see some logic in the team selection to an extent. Mm. I thought it was too negative because Brighton had lost 4 0 their previous game. And I felt this is a big time. <laughs> I feel like it was a real opportunity for us. And we, we were so negative and we seeded the whole thing to them. When we should have gone out and got at them, and made it was like a library that ground. There was no atmosphere. Mm. We could have like uh, made it even worse and really put Brighton on the back foot. And we were we didn't do that. And but the only thing I didn't like about the team selection, particularly, was Ilanga not playing because we had no pace, no out ball. Poor Chris Wood. He, I think he's getting a bit of stick in the comments. I thought he was all right and he had no service, but. Uh, just was the way we set up completely wrong, Emily, because we it seemed so inevitable mm. we were going to be on the back foot yeah. throughout that half. Well, of course. Alanga's one of our most creative, threatening, attacking, fastest players, and he sat on the subs bench till the 50-odd minute or whenever it was that he came on. Also, the centre-backs were wrong, and I said this the other day. You know, I think oh, Vamadeli and Murillo are great players. Murillo had a decent game today. But they're both young, they're early 20s. They need someone with experience at the back with them in games like this, whether it's a Bolly, a Nia Carti or a Felipe. And honestly, I really think that that cost us today for those silly mistakes at the back. But, you know, I, looking at it in hindsight, yes, the team selection was wrong and, and nothing seemed to work today. Why on earth didn't we start with the team that ended the Liverpool game? Because we took Liverpool, one of the best teams in Europe, probably up there with Man City these days. And we took them to nil-nil up until the 97th minute. Yet today, we decide to tinker with the formation in a game that we really should be getting something out of. It's not the game to do it. And I'm sorry, I think, you know, we, we, we will probably talk about the red card. We can blame that. We can blame poor refereeing decisions. But I'm fed up. I'm fed up of us narrowly missing out on games by a goal. And it was OK when we were scoring goals, but we're not even scoring goals now. So we're, we're defending pretty averagely, we're conceding pretty average goals and we're losing to teams yet again that haven't had to come out of second gear. It's it's so frustrating it's, and I feel so sorry for all the fans that have gone down to Brighton today. That horrible journey down there in this miserable weather and they've seen that. I mean, it's just not fair. Yeah, I mean, we've been pretty... I think we've been very supportive of Nuno on this podcast. The only yeah. game where we've really gone for him, to an extent even was Villa away when Nia Kate kind of blew up in his face and he changed it at half time. But I think that's two away games now, Greg, in a row, where I feel like the manager, especially today, has been a decisive factor in a negative results. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Am I wrong? That's a terrible question for us. No, you're not wrong. I mean, ultimately, it comes down to, 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 to team selection. And the Villa game, putting Nia Kate at left back when Toffolo's on the bench was a disaster. And... It's clear as day that that's on the manager. And going into our... This is our next away game, isn't it? We, we played Liverpool last game. Yeah. So at home. That's our next away game. And we haven't been great on the road it's in the whole of the Premier League. Let's remember that. So it, it, we'll come on to the games remaining shortly. But when we're going away from home, picking up points is not easy for Nottingham Forest. 
So, Emily's absolutely right. Why are you changing the team that put up such a fantastic performance last Saturday to a team that no one expected to take out your most potent weapons? And we've been a counter-attacking side. We have scored the most goals on the break in the Premier League. We're not the top of the charts on many other th positive things, but we are top of the charts on scoring goals from breaks and counter-attacks. So it clearly is a weapon for us. We've scored early in games, and we've also scored um, in injury time of first half a few times as well. So we've mm. scored goal important goals at the right time. Let's not forget that we touched on Origi having that chance just after they scored. And it's a different game if he puts it away. And then there's the Wood um, shot in the second half. Their keeper makes a good save. Chris Wood got a very good connection on that and um, did, did better than I thought he was going to do. But other than that, I think Emily was saying the chances were very few and far between. Mm -hmm. So you go back to the team selection and you think, well, actually, yeah, and hindsight is a wonderful thing. Let's not, let's, let's remember that. But you do think, you know what? He's not really normally a tinker man, you know? You normally know, you normally know what you're going to get with him. And I feel that maybe he's trying to shuffle his pack a little bit unnecessarily. He left Sangare out again, which earlier on in the week on the podcast that you guys were doing, I think he was in most people's team to come back in. I think he was being talked about to come back in to start. And I, I'm feeling very negative about Sangare. Um, I think that he's going to be out the door in the summer, even if we stay in the Premier League. I don't think he fits into the club. I don't think he's positive. I think we're missing Mangala more than ever. It, now, in the cold light of day, seems a very strange decision to let him go and keep what we've got because I think Mangala will be making a difference and Sangari is making none. Yeah, I mean, that was not a good cameo and it was typified <laughs> at the end where he's just kicking gross in the back. You know, yeah. we're trying to get out. We've got, we're mm. deep in stoppage time. We're such a naive team. I mean, you know, I think that's another one of the many issues. And... I don't know. Do you think Brighton were there for the taking, Emily? We'll get into some specifics soon, but it just felt to me like they were. The, the thing is, and this is another one that, thing that annoys me, how many teams have had to play over like 80% of what they can do to beat us? I don't think Brighton got out of third gear, and that really no. pisses me off. Yeah, no. And they, they on paper today, they were 100% for the taking because of that heavy defeat in Roma, and they've had some do dodgy Premier League results as well. And I know they've only lost one game at home all season, but they have had a bit of a tricky time with things. And during the game today, they weren't anything special. And I think the Brighton fans will probably say, had Forrest turned up today, we could have got something out of the game. But I'm, I'm struggling to find a single player that I'd think, oh, you know, they gave it their all today. You know, even Nico had a quiet game for him. Murillo was OK before we conceded the goal. I thought, oh, Matt Sells seems quite confident in goal today. He, he made a few decent saves. But it, it, I just feel like we could have gone on for 130 minutes today and I still don't think we'd have created enough chances to be able to score and put a goal in the back of the net. There was not one moment that I was up going... There wasn't that we didn't have that today, did we? At all. And like I say, Chris Wood's chance actually was a decent chance, and he did really well with that. And you know, maybe another day that may have gone in, but God, I'm just yeah, I'm I'm trying. I don't think yeah. it would I don't think it would have been the plan either to bring Ty Warawani on and keep Chris Wood on as well. No. I can't imagine that that was in the game plan. It would have been we'll play Chris Wood, he'll go off, Ty will come on, we'll play with our regular formation and shape. We seem to go 4-4-2 in the second half. Then it seemed to go to whatever it is, 2-3-1. Um, it, it was it was ever-changing and substitutions were made. I mean, Kiate coming on for Gibbs-White was an interesting one. I can only imagine that was because Morgan was probably feeling fatigued. But with 10 minutes to go and in the injury time, which was just a complete waste of time as far as far as concerned, because we didn't have the ball. But... Yeah, you know, it, it it just, you're right, we could have gone on forever and ever and ever and not scored today. And they, they got a, a sneaky goal, um, I call it a sneaky goal, it, it just felt they didn't really do much with that, it was our own fault. Um, and they didn't like scoring much beyond that, so had it finished nil-nil, we probably would have come away feeling we'd nicked a point, but it wasn't to be. Yeah, I mean, I know some people in the comments are probably saying we're overreacting, but there's 10 games left now. And we have to grab yeah. our own opportunities and we have to play well. And there's ways to lose games. We could have lost that game 1-0 and the tone could be completely different. But if we play like that, 
we're going to go down and we're going to deserve to go down. It'll be entirely our fault. It won't be referees' fault. Mm. It won't be mm. VAR's fault. Points deductions probably won't help us. But we've got to play better than that. Mm. And that's I, rubbish. I, I'm very rarely negative, about, particularly about Forest, And I can always find a positive. And I think Matt can attest to that. I will always find the positive, any of the players, the, the, the manager. And, and um, honestly, today was bad. I was so proud of the Forest lads last week against Liverpool. I was angry, but I was so proud of that performance that they put in, bar that last bit at the end. But today, I just felt like no one was playing for the shirt. No one was actually putting their neck on the line. And that's exactly what we should be doing at this stage in the season. And believe, you know, I we all want Forest to stay up. None of us want Forest to go down, but we've got to just We've got to get something out of those games and we've got to give it 100%. And if we don't give it 100%, why the hell are those players on the pitch? Hmm. I mean, we could have gone 15th today. That's another thing. Mm. I, I didn't expect us to go there and win. I think that was a difficult task. But I think yeah. we could have gone there and got a point. Like you saw Luton scraped a point. I watched that game yesterday. Luton scraped a point. They weren't that good. Liverpool, um, Everton lost. Brentford lost. They actually played quite well. Uh, Thomas Frank was funny at the end, uh, moaning about refs. But it was such an opportunity for us. And that's what that's what annoys me. It's, just talk through the goal, Greg, then. I mean, it felt like it had been coming in terms of set pieces. We we hadn't defended them particularly well. I saw a goal from Notts County at the weekend, which, you know, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't any better particularly. Um, you know, is that all on us? Uh, Forrest were complaining about it. There should have been a, a foul. I couldn't see one. What about you? No, there was, there was nothing to complain about. I think there was more wishful complaining than anything else. Mm. But going back to the tackle, Omar Bamadeli goes in and fouls their man. Lucky not to get a second yellow. But I'm, un, I'm, I'm confused as to why he's put that type of challenge in because their player wasn't even trying to cross the ball. He was actually sweeping it backwards to someone. So it felt like a bit more of a bit of an unnecessary challenge to make especially in that danger area. And it goes back to what we've been doing all season, was conceding stupid free kicks in silly areas. And it, it puts us under pressure because we're not very good at defending or haven't been very good at defending set pieces. So when the ball comes in and, and it drops into the goal, I, I, I was with my son and my dad watching it, and we just looked at each other and said, has that gone in? It, it was just bizarre. It's like, and then the, because the Forest players were all complaining, I said to my dad, Oh, it's going to be ruled out. There must have been an elbow in there because Sales looked like he was coming for it and he was going to clear it. And I said, he, he must have had an elbow in there somewhere. He must have had someone pulling his shirt or something. And we looked at the replay and we all we all said, no, that's a goal. No, no argument. So, yeah, it was just a, a bit of a funny goal to concede. We could have scored straight away, as I said before, with Origi. But on the set pieces, again, just quickly, whilst we're on, on that topic, our own set pieces are absolutely awful. We don't do anything with our own set pieces when we are trying to score a goal. So whatever is going on at the club in terms of defending a set piece or when we're attacking the set piece, in terms of having a shot on goal or trying to be creative with something, we're non-existent. We're not even there. And, and, and I said to my dad as well, these are the kind of danger areas. We had a few free kicks in their kind of dangerous final third just outside the penalty box. And I said, under normal circumstances, I would be thinking, right, this is a really good place we, we could score from here. But I knew we didn't have anything up our sleeve to conjure up, and I just knew we weren't going to score. So bad at defending set pieces, bad at our own set pieces when on, on the attack, a bad goal to concede. Um, Sales did make a good save for an earlier set piece when Gross put one in and it got flicked on. But, yeah, defensively very bad. Now, I'm Obama Daily. He he's got to take take the blame for that because that was a needless free kick to give away. Yeah, I mean, our set piece. I defended our set pieces in the week, saying they're not so bad attacking wise. They just don't have variety. They were rubbish today. Mm. I mean, like we've hired Mark Clattenberg for marginal gains, and this is a different topic. But set pieces, Emily, are not marginal gains. They're like a massive part of the game, and we spent yeah. the whole season been absolutely rubbish at them. I mean, how can we not be addressing it? And get somebody and get, as a consultant or something. And we get plenty. We get pl we had plenty today, didn't we? Um, Marillo even took a free quick at one point. It unfortunately went straight down the keeper's throat. But um, I can't fathom how we are not a threat at free kicks. And a bit like Greg said, when when we get them, particularly today, I was like, yeah, so what? Free kick on the edge of the box? Yeah. 
they'll, they'll it'll either go into the wall or you know, know they'll it will go over it will go wide you know I, I I can't put my head around get my head around it because Morgan Gibbs White is a really good creative player he's he's got all those facets that we know he's a great finisher and we've got Callum Hudson Adoy who knows how to strike a ball um Murillo clearly showed today he can strike a ball too um we've got a good headers of the ball in um Chris Wood today yet yeah, it just never seems to connect the dots never seem to connect Corners are a perfect opportunity, aren't they, to take advantage in a game? Yeah, every corner we have, you know, it's not going to amount to anything. And I can't work out what's going wrong because, you know, as much as I feel really cross with all the players today, our best starting 11, that starting 11 that I wanted to start, should have been more than a match for Brighton. We've got talented players. And I think if talented players are playing in the correct positions, that's a really good point, in the really correct positions, then, you know, we... We should have done something with those set pieces today. I felt like, I think you mentioned it, Greg, like Dominguez out on the left. Why is he there? Put him where he's good. Put him where he knows how to play. And sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, but I just feel like everything went wrong today and set pieces was just kind of another part of what went wrong. Yeah. What well, like against Man United? Go on, Greg, sorry. sorry. sorry I just wanted to say as well, when it comes to the Brighton team, they've got a lot of very key players out as well. I mean, they, they were an understrength Brighton side. And we had an opportunity to play, to play probably our full strength team. We've, you know, we're, we're missing, we've, we've had players missing for different reasons this season. But we, with that bench and the players that started, we had an opportunity to play arguably our strongest team. Maybe Aina and Tavares might be a better left back. But arguably, we could have played our strongest side. And every point matters now. Every point matters. So going back to what you asked before, Matt, about the team selection, I think when you look at it like that, then it's a bit of a clangor from Nino Espirito Santo. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Dominguez had done all right against Man United in that role, but he, I thought he set the tone in a negative way. And I don't know if he's fully fit, so I'm not going to be too critical of him. Um, I think he, he unfortunately fouls away. Yeah, and he, he got an early yellow, didn't he, as well, which I think can change a player's game. And we actually yeah, got it's a bit a, of a harsh yellow as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Nico got one in the first half as well, didn't he? So that kind of changes, I think, how a, the, the risks a player is prepared to take in a game. So I don't think that helped. And I think Dominguez is great. I just I don't necessarily think he was playing in the right place today. No, because Nuno came in. He was really positive. Like we went, we went and attacked games. We mm. stripped it back to. You're the players. Here's what you're good at. And now it just feels like these last couple of away games, we've regressed to these are our weaknesses. Let's cover them up. And that's what Steve Cooper did. And I hope it's just a thing in isolation because we've got a massive game next week against Luton and we can't mess it up again like we did. So, yeah, that's a big worry. We'll just take a quick break to let my blood pressure uh, go down for the next 15 <laughs> seconds. Uh, and this isn't people asking about my drink. It's not wine or anything. It's just Ribena, but it needs to be something a lot stronger. So we'll yeah. see you on the other side. Oh, that is, is that wine? Yeah, it's a spritzer. Spritzer's fine. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, Steve Allen does make a good point in the comments about Luton playing Bournemouth before us. We'll touch on that before the end, Steve, about uh, that game and uh, our game against them next Saturday. Uh, back to this one, uh, Emily. I mean, I was saying after like 25 minutes, we need to take a midfielder off and get a Langer mm. on. And I'm sure other guys were coming up with suggestions for what we need to do at half time. And you said it was like baffling that nothing changed at half time. I suppose we did start the second half better, but we, like yeah. you've said here, yeah, we didn't really hurt them though, did we? No, I actually thought, um, we did start, so I was disappointed when we didn't make any substitutions at half time. But actually, the first five, ten minutes or so, I thought actually, maybe he's told them up enough to try and get something out of this. And there were a few chances where we could have scored, but obviously we didn't capitalise. And ironically, it almost seemed to go wrong when the better players came on. Because like you say, it wasn't the formation we'd expect, keeping Wood on, bringing Ty on to two up front. Ty won't be used to that. Chris Wood certainly isn't used to that. Um, so it, it just it just never seemed to work. The oddest substitution for me was taking Gibbs White off for Czech Coate at the end. And I know you were saying he, he looked a bit leggy, but reading his body language, he didn't want to come off and he was very upset to have come off. And I think, as we know with Gibbs White, he'd be walking wounded and he'd still be on that pitch. 
and we lost any creative spark that we had as soon as he'd gone off the pitch. Not that we had much to begin with, but I, I just thought that was a really odd substitution um, to make. Um, and the second half, I guess, just petered out, didn't it? They Brighton didn't really have any threats, particularly in the second half, but then again, neither did we, and we had all these opportunities. Um, I think Callum had said Adoy's free kick on the edge of the box was in the, the what well, the one he won was in the second half, but I, I just couldn't see a scoring today. And there was obviously the red card that we haven't really talked about. When I first saw it, I was umming and ring, saw the VAR replay, and thought, yes, that's a red card. And I was for about a minute really angry, thinking, oh, yet again, we've been undone by the refs, and this is a terrible decision. But actually, had he been sent off, would we have scored? Probably not. And I think you mentioned this, Matt. We've, we've got to stop hiding behind these bad refereeing decisions. We've actually just got to focus on our game because bad refereeing decisions happen in every game. And I know that we sometimes feel we're hard done by, but um, I, I just don't think it would have made, I don't think it would have possibly made a difference today because we just didn't, we didn't have that finish that, that we've had had before. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, let's expand on that then. I mean, I thought actually, I thought Stupenham was really struggling and mm. Rigi didn't cash in. And I wish Elanga had started to cash in, but Elanga wasn't so good when he came on. Uh, I, th- I thought who I thought was really good when they came on was L- Lalana. Who I just thought dictated the game and they, they played the game out and they didn't really need to go for us. So, yeah, we could have got a nil-nil, but Brighton were in the front and Brighton were dictating it. And that's why I yeah. thought... It, it put a slant on the game where they didn't even have to play that well. They just managed it well. Right. Um, the the red card incident then, Greg, uh, Moda on uh, Nico Williams. What was your take on it? In real time, I didn't quite get enough of a, of a view to have a, an opinion, as possibly didn't the ref, which was why he kept his card in his pocket for a while. And he, you know, he probably did the right thing just having a think about what happened and when it happens very quickly or maybe in an angle that you can't quite see when you're a referee then that's why VAR is there because you can give a yellow card and it got reviewed rightly so and once it got reviewed and then we were getting a look at it in slow motion and all the angles I was astonished that it wasn't he wasn't sent over to the screen to have a look at that again absolutely disgusted because if that isn't a red card then i don't know what is i'm not saying i wanted a red card because we'd have gone on to win the game and that was the reason why we lost but in for that case in isolation and for the whole reason as to why we have var in our game it had to be a red card both feet left the the grass he was flying through the air and he had his his foot up with the stud showing and he crashed into nico's ankle and the the commentary on the, the game I was watching fully agreed, fully said that's a leg breaker. Now Nico, Nico could have been seriously hurt, so I'm astonished that that was not given as a red card. You're right, we probably wouldn't have gone on the scored, but at the same time, you never know. It's fine margins. There's that phrase that we all hate. It's fine margins. It's small differences. It's something to turn a game. Because you never know that red card gets shown. All of a sudden, they're taking a step further back in their half. Those amazing Nottingham Forest fans are lifted in that stadium. And they're thinking, right, this is our chance now to to, to not only get a goal, but maybe go on and win the game. So those kind of moments can have a huge effect on any football match. And yeah, we've felt very, very aggrieved. On a lot of games, it always seems to be a decision that we're not happy about. And um, Mark Clattenburg has definitely come to the right club if he wants to get involved on having conversations with referees because it seems to be happening week in, week out. So, yeah, I'm not blaming it on the defeat, but as in isolation, I'm disgusted that it wasn't a red card. I've not watched uh, many of the games. So I've seen bits of all of them, so maybe it happened today, but um, when was the last time a referee looked at a screen in a game you've seen? I'm really struggling to think, because this happened every game, multiple times. If people can drop this in the comments, when was the last time a referee was even sent to a screen to review mm. a VAR decision? It's just a, like a close mm. shot to back up a referee's on-field decision. Yeah. And that's why I said to you, Emily, in the thing, when you said, Greg said, Greg Mitchell said, was it a red? And you said yes. And I, I said, said yes. I said I don't think it's going to be overturned, so it's mm. not. It's probably not going to be. 
but the challenge is a red card one but it's just another example um, yeah. of why VAR is just not working yeah and, and I think I said in response well if that's not a red what's the point in VAR what why stop the game why look at all those angles How, is that an okay is that okay to do that then is that just a yellow <laughs> card offense you can put your studs up you can potentially break a player's legs um it's really frustrating the last time I remember it at the city ground was when I think Yates he did that to the ref and I think he did end up going over and I just can't remember what game it was it was a night game but you're right this season I think the VAR and the on on field refs seem to have uh what's the word like less disagreement they seem to be more um agreeing with each other um and yeah it is it's just another case isn't it I heard um Nuno and Morgan Gibbs-White were both interviewed um, after the games. I just saw it on the BBC Sport website and both of them were talking about the red card and how frustrating it was and and that, you know, an apology from the PGO MOL is all well and good, but it doesn't give us points. Um, but I, I think I still stand by the fact that, yeah, I think it would have given us a lift. I think that's a really good point, Greg, and it would have given the fans in the stadium a lift. But I don't know, you know, we'll never know. We'll never know, will we? But we, we won't. Yeah, it's it's just frustrating, really frustrating. On this on the screen, um, you were talking about Matt. It, it feels like someone at the PGMOL, Howard Webb or whoever it is, it's almost like they've, they're under instruction now because something has definitely changed. Mm. Because when VAR first came into the Premier League, they never had the go over to the screen script screen and have a look um, at all. It was always referred to VAR. VAR made the decision to, to, to go with on field and make a different decision. And that was that. And then they did a very um, deliberate change where they introduced referees going to the screen. And, and it made everyone feel a little bit more secure that the guy that's actually on the pitch ref in the game is the one that's going to make the decision. So it's there to be used. The screen is there. You can go to the screen. Michael Oliver went to the screen when we played, I think it was Brentford when we had the penalty last season. And yeah, he was given, he was sent to the screen and he could have, uh, most, most of the time, when you're sent to the screen, you think, okay, they're going to overturn it. Mm. But Michael Oliver stuck to his decision. Said, no, no, I've given a penalty. I've seen it on the screen and I'm even now sure that it's a penalty. But if you're not going to send the referee over to, to maybe give himself a chance to have another look at it, then, then what is the point? Because mm. if the VAR says, look, I want you to go and look at the screen, not to say anything else, don't even pass an opinion. To say mm. we've had a look at it, we think you should go and have another look at it on the screen and make your mind up. That's all he's got to do. And then if he then decides, no, nah, it's not a red card, then okay, we can still be very upset about it. But at least we know that he's had that look. Because mm. I'm not convinced that these VA, that these these referees are capable. There's so much incompetence throughout the referees. It's ridiculous. And I could go on and on and on. I'm starting to feel my blood boil a bit now. So I am I think I'm coming back into how I was feeling after the game. Because a lot of my anger was about that red card as much as it was about us losing the game the way we did. Yeah. But for me, still, the big takeaway is it wasn't the biggest factor in defeat. And I, I know the headlines I've seen already, and people mm. send the screenshots saying the headlines are around VAR. And I understand why they are, but they shouldn't be from a Forest point of view. They should be. We haven't played well enough and we've got to do better mm. and control what we can control. Mark said it last week. Refs are not going to do us any favours. We've seen that already. Eventually, yeah. you kind of hope that something will go our way. But maybe, it, like, and Greg says as what Greg said today about Omar Bamadelli, he could have got a red card, potentially. So, yeah, yeah we've been screwed over again, but we just got to play better. It's as simple as that, really. Yeah. It um, really is. Right. Let's move on. Uh, and, uh <laughs> I don't think there's much more to say about the game. I mean, like, even in stoppage time, like you said, Emily, I never thought, or well, did you ever think we're going to score no. at any point? No, because no. there are certain games, aren't there, that we've been in, and um, you feel like we're going to get something out of this. You could just sense that we're going to score a late equaliser or a late winner, or, you know, I know that hasn't happened for an awful long time, but today there was just nothing really. Um yeah, and it's it's been a long time that I've felt like this. I just feel totally deflated and a little bit resigned today. I'm hoping by tomorrow that I'll feel a little bit better about it. And I, yeah, I, th I think, oh, one last thing I wanted to say about the VARs and the referees, like you say, they're not, they're not going to do us any favours. So there's no point in sulking about it. We've got to stop this sulking attitude. And I'm not blaming anyone for that because I've sulked about it and I'm really annoyed about it. I'm talking about us, us all. 
what we've got to you do is all that frustration and anger we've got over the VAR and officials, use it on the pitch, use it in the stands to get behind the team and hope that can get us over the line. Don't give referees an excuse to, you know, have these game changing decisions. Um, yeah, I just, I just think it's just going to make us bitter and yeah, it's just not going to help us. Mm, I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean, hopefully, I'll, I'll be back tomorrow, obviously, and hopefully I'm in a better <laughs> mood. But we'll be back at one o'clock with Kelvin, Greg Mitchell and Temps. I really want to hear Kelvin's take on it. He might lift me, but right now it feels it feels down. But tomorrow's a new day. So let's talk just quickly while I've got you guys here. Thoughts on the Luton game? Um, I suppose, Greg, or um, a lot of it, or some of it depends on how the Luton v Bournemouth game goes on Wednesday. I mean, they could move mm. level on points with us, which would crank up the, the anxiety even more, I guess, wouldn't it? Well, we we could we could start that game against Luton in the bottom three. If if they win against Bournemouth, they will go above us on goal difference. We we will be in the bottom three, and then of course, I think we're expecting a, um, the, the the points deduction verdict on Friday. I've heard that's that's the the, the date the day before the Luton game as to if we're going to get any points off. So it's all happening at the end of this next week coming. But for the game itself, let's say that they, they get nothing against Bournemouth. Let's say that we we don't go into the bottom three. That's going to be quite huge, I think, psychologically. I think mm. for us, we need to think that it's in our hands. And at the moment, it is still in our hands. We've got 10 games left. Now, Nuno, when he first came in, I think over his first set of games, was averaging a point a game. If we take 10 points from our next or remaining 10 games, that's going to put us to finish on 34, 34 points. Is that going to be enough? I'm not sure. Um, I think that in our next seven games, we could take nine points. And then those last three games, Sheffield United, Chelsea and Burnley, I think we got we could take seven points there. We could end up on 40. So I'm looking at our games left. I'm looking at how many points we we might end up on, and at best, I'm I've got us still on 40 points. So that makes me feel actually really positive. But I don't think Luton are going to get that many points. So next Saturday is quite possibly the biggest game of our lives, <laughs> and and I say that because if Luton are going to, are going to approach this like the cup final of all cup finals, their tails are mm. up. Nothing does a team any any better than scoring a last minute um, equaliser. I watched that game as well yesterday. Crystal Palace should have had three or four, but Luton just keep coming and keep coming and keep mm -hmm. coming. And Andros Townsend floats this delicious ball in, and it gets glanced in, and, and all of a sudden they're walking away with a point. Now these valuable points are valuable points, and we don't seem to be getting any at the moment. So we have to go into next Saturday. And it has to be treated as one of our biggest games ever because our Premier League survival is on the line. Ten games left. Our away form has been, as I said before, our away form has been just awful in the Premier League. So we've got to try and find a way to pick up points in niggly games away at Luton, away at Everton, Burnley and Sheffield United. It's not a given we're going to get points there, but it has to start on Saturday. Everything has to start on Saturday with the kind of performance and the kind of team selection that we can get some belief back into the club and back into the fan base for the last 10 games, or we are going to be sleepwalking into the championship. And I'll tell you what, if we could sleepwalk and go back into the championship, it would just be the most forest thing in the world to be down there for another 23 years. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely... Sorry, but it's, it, uh, that's how they about it I, I, it's just when we go down it's, it's even for, with forest it's either very very good or very very bad yeah that's been yeah. my life as a forest family yeah i mean the notion that we could get relegated below the current bottom three people are going to think i'm being disrespectful but they're not very good and if we go down we are we are rubbish if we go down below them because oh, i don't know i mean is it the biggest game since wembley emily next next one yeah i was just thinking about Wembley it, it yeah absolutely it feels because Wembley felt more comfortable to me I felt like we we're always going to win that game it feels as important to me as Sheffield United second leg semi-final playoffs 
it's that nervy for me. Um, and it's actually quite a scary prospect. But I think Luton will probably go into that game as favourites. And like you say, they've got their tails up. Um, they're grinding out results. Um, they're not expected to win these games generally. So there's no pressure on them. Um, if they can get something against Bournemouth midweek, if we get some points deducted at the end of the week, then again, that's that all works in their favour. But I just think we need to, once we've finished licking our wounds from today, it's backs against the wall. It's the forest that played against Arsenal last season. It's the forest that ground out results against Liverpool, um, against Chelsea, against Brighton, against Southampton. We have to be that forest. I know the personnel's different, but we have to have that attitude. And we have to go into that game, no stone left unturned, everyone giving it 100%. I want every single player is walking wounded coming off that pitch at the end of the match and knowing that we gave everything to get three points against Luton. Because as Greg says, Saturday is the start of our survival proper. And if we can't beat Luton on Saturday, I fear the worst. I do not want us to be what Leicester were last season. Leicester slept, walked into relegation. Everyone kept saying Leicester are too good to go down. You could argue Forest on paper are too good to go down. No team is too good to go down. And I do not want that to be us. No, I mean, as you know, Oliver says in the comments, we aren't very good either. We wouldn't be in this mess. I think he's right because we, the results prove it. I think the frustrating thing is we should have so, so many more points here and there. And we've just let ourselves down. Or we've missed opportunities. And I said this at the top of the show. We don't make teams play well to beat us. And that is no. really frustrating. And this is another game. Luton make teams play well to beat them, uh, mostly. Burnley and Sheffield United are somehow picking up points. But I don't think, you know, I still think they're going to go. But I, like sleep, we're not even sleepwalking towards the bottom of the table at the moment. <laughs> we're just, we're, we're getting into a gentle jog and we're going to be sprinting if we lose to Luton. So, Do you yeah, not think though, you, you talk about the fact we don't, teams don't need to play well to beat us. I would say that's the middle to lower teams. Against the likes of Liverpool and Arsenal, we seem to be able to put up a fight. Why can't we have that attitude in the games that we're maybe expected to get something out of? Because Arsenal beat us 2-1. It was narrow. It was a narrow defeat in the end, both at the Emirates and at the City ground. Yet they've absolutely pummeled other teams. Why can't we have that same attitude when we go into these games against um, Luton, Sheffield United, Burnley, Brentford, Everton? That's the frustrating thing for me, is we, we just assume, oh, we're going to win this. No, we've got to go into every game like we're playing against the Liverpool yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Like Liverpool, we really fronted up, and well, you mm. don't know what Forest is going to front up. And I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like as bad as Villa in this one, but it wasn't good. It, like if we were picking a man in the match or someone out of a six over a six out of ten, I don't think there was anyone over a six out of ten. I thought Nico was decent, but uh, no one, no one was, no one but was quite good. Him. Murillo was okay. I thought Murillo was okay. I thought Sells was okay, barring the blunder for the goal. But other than that. I, I thought um, Danilo didn't have a great first half, but he started to actually get into yeah. the game in the second half and then was taken off. So mm. that, again, was a bit strange. It's, you know, he was just starting to find a bit of flow. So that was another um, strange decision. But in term, we've always seemed to play better against the better teams. It's, it's mm. been a theme again as long as I've been a Forest fan. Yeah. We always play better against the better sides. And the ones that are the so-called lower down the division sides, we we got come unstuck and it's just been something that's always happened and that's got to stop. Um, Luton deserve huge credit. They deserve mm -hmm. huge credit. If, if we weren't stuck down there on the 17th and in that battle with them and safe, I'd be dying for them to stay in the Premier League. Yeah. I'd be loving every second of them doing what they're doing. You know, that's what I remember when I was um, a lad, <laughs> Luton were in the first division and the, the League Cup final against Luton. It's a great story. It's great that they're doing so well and they haven't spent loads and loads of money and you know and all that kind of all that kind of jazz. Um, but we've got to beat them. And it's you know I've got I've got a friend who's a Luton fan and um, yeah I don't want to be having to have a conversation with him after next Saturday where they've won and we're really stuck in it. Yeah. Okay. How yeah. how Forest would this be right? Say so, Luton beat Bournemouth midweek. We get a points deduction. Luton beat us at the weekend, but then we go on a mega run and stay up anyway. You that would be the uh, that would be the, that would be so Forest, wouldn't it? That we'd get I don't know, like we beat Man City. You know, we can't beat Luton away, but we suddenly beat. But I don't want that, by the way. But that would be so 
go forest, wouldn't it? To be, we'd be totally down and out and then suddenly rise from the, yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah. yeah. Take that now. Yeah, Lute. Luton are everyone's second team this season. It was us yeah. last season, but now everyone wants us to yeah. go down, and we just, you know, maybe even try and use that as a, a mentality thing. So we'll see. We are, yeah. I mean, last sixty seconds have been positive. I think the previous forty-four minutes and twenty-three seconds were pretty, pretty downbeat. But we'll always try and end on a, a, a try and end on a bit of an upbeat note. And Emily's right. There's still. There's still time. There's still time. <laughs> right. Uh, thanks very much, everyone who's joined us. Great to have 550 people with us. If you are new around here, do us a favour. Hit like. Hit subscribe. You can become a channel member. You can give us a good review on iTunes. I keep reading them. It's great to see them and Spotify as well. Really appreciate all that. So, yeah, good of so many people to join us on, on such a, a downbeat show. Really appreciate that. Any final words, Emily? Um, I just want to mention someone called Julie, who I know listens to the podcast. She won't be listening now, but she had an horrendous journey down to the Amex today. And Julie, a bit like me, is really positive Forest fan. And she sent this to the podcast group. I don't know if you saw this, Matt. I'm so angry. It took mm. us five hours to get there. We were rewarded with that performance. Didn't understand the team selection. Thought Forest would come out fighting after the Liverpool came. Didn't seem to care. And she said to me as a follow-up, she's normally really, really positive, but it really got her down today. So I said I'd give her a mention. Julie, I hope you've had a safe journey back by the time you listen to this. And um, hopefully Forrest can pull it out of the bag against Luton. And I guess that's just to all the Forest fans that went down to Brighton today, whether they made a weekend of it or um, just went down for the day. It's horrible, isn't it? Especially on a grey, miserable day. And then you get that performance and you've got that horrible long journey back up to Nottingham. So safe journey back to everyone on their way back. Yeah, and I think that sums it up. And you're right, Julie is a positive person. And it's interesting that we're all pretty positive. And we are massively downbeat, which I think shows <laughs> yeah. when it's bad, it's bad. And it was bad today. So, yeah, I think that sums it up. Oh, as Ian McGee says, this can be my one. And I'm sure everyone, happy oh, Mother's yeah. Day. So, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you look bad not saying happy Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Uh, yeah, uh, hopefully you had a better day than us if you don't like football. Which you don't. Right, <laughs> Greg Oram, not Greg Mitchell. I almost said Greg yeah. Mitchell then. Um, <laughs> uh, any final words from you, Greg Oram? Yes, um, I want to put a shout out to all those Forest fans as well quickly that made the journey to Brighton. We had a chance to go, actually. We we had a chance to, to go down to the game. Um, and because it was Mother's Day, the decision was taken not to go. Um, so I need to say thank you and happy Mother's Day to my wonderful, beautiful wife, Evelina, because she <laughs> has been superb as ever and allowing me to pop on and be part of the podcast tonight on Mother's Day. Um, no problem whatsoever. She's absolutely wonderful. So I love her dearly and she puts up with me. Um, but also one other thing, I'm usually in the comments uh, watching this. So it is surreal and wonderful and exciting to be on the podcast it's like it's like um, it's it's like getting it's like when you dream of playing for Forest and all of a sudden you you, you get a chance to go onto the Forest pitch. It's like I'm it's, I feel like that. I'm kind of getting a chance to step out from the, the crowd and you know put on a shirt and take part. And it's absolutely fantastic. But I am a member. I am a member of this stream, and the reason why I'm a member is because it's the best Forest podcast there is. And Matt has gone full time with this. And it's six podcasts a week at least, I think. Sometimes um, sometimes more perhaps, but great guests. And a variety of ex-pros and people like Emily who are in the industry and, and fans as well. And, and I just think that if you're watching like I watch all the time, sign up and become a member. It costs a couple of quid or two, two, two pound fifty or whatever it is. It doesn't cost very much. And this is how Matt makes his living now. You've done so well, Matt, to just go all in. So you've got my undying support. And I hope a lot of other people now sign up, become a member now, push the button. Come on, you can do it. Because um, that's how these podcasts will keep getting made with more great guests. So thank you for having me. It's been great. And happy Mother's Day to all of you. And we're going to stay up. Come on, we can do this. Well, you're a fine man, partly for those words, but more so because you've really covered your ass with your wife by uh, okay. saying all that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I should also say my son Orlando as well. He was very excited that I was coming on, so yeah, he might be Aww. watching with his mummy. 
<laughs> well, shout out to Orlando as well. You look oh, good on him. Good. Right. Uh, yes, thank you very much. We shall uh, leave it there. Emily's going to go and ring her mum, uh, and I should better do that as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even texted her yet, and it's 20 past seven. Uh, yeah. So thanks yeah. very much, everyone. Uh, great. I know. It's terrible, isn't it? Uh, good to have so many people with us. Back tomorrow at 1 p.m. Kelvin Wilson. Um, Greg Mitchell and uh, Michael Temple will be joining me and then I'll work out the rest of the week from there and drop it in the comments uh, but yeah we shall then turn the page to Luton and as Greg Mitchell says uh, yeah we can do it we can stay up uh, yes today was Ooh. rubbish but tomorrow is a new day so Emily Anderson thank you very much thank you cheers cheers <laughs> Craig Oram thank you very much thank you very much thank you fantastic uh, have a good evening, everyone, and we shall see you tomorrow.